And um, so, so we've just kind of been following a theme. We started asking the question, you know, how can God be good and still allow for, for these bad things to happen? And how do you as a Christian hold your faith in the midst of all these things? And then how do you deal with this, with this constant wrestle of a bunch of bad things happening that maybe you don't feel like you deserve and then they're still happening? And so we looked at Philippians, and that was kind of, you know, Paul's guide of how to, I don't know how you would put that, stay positive, how you uh, <coughs> keep your focus on what it should be focused on, however you want to say that. And we looked at how it helped his, what he says in Philippians, helps with depression and anxiety and, and all those kinds of things. Um, and then we kind of looked a little bit deeper um, with the book of Job, um, kind of really just continuing on in that same cycle. But now uh, we come up to the third um, of the series of books that we're going to look at, and that's Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk is a minor prophet from the uh, Old Testament, so it's, it's in that space in the Bible before the book of Matthew and after, you know, Job and Psalms and the poetic books. Um, there's, you know, there, there's a lot of the, the, the big prophets that everybody knows about, like Elijah and um, Isaiah. Uh, but Habakkuk is one of those, it's called the minor prophets. Um, they, the minor prophets typically um, only prophesied for a few years. Um, their books are typically shorter in length. Um, they typically have a more narrow focus, whereas like Jeremiah, for instance, has prophecies about a bunch of different things. Habakkuk really just has one single focus, um, as the minor prophets do. Um, so, some themes that are um, very evident from the book. Um, first off is that God is in control. Um, the book of Habakkuk is basically this. The prophet is having a hard time understanding why evil people aren't being punished for their evil. That's basically the, sum the summary of it. And he, it's almost like, God, I don't understand, you know, aren't you the one in control here? What, what's going on? And so throughout the book, God just kind of reaffirms, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, I ate before I, before yams, and it always makes me burp. Um, and so one of the big themes of the book is that God is in control. And uh, he does see when, when evil people do evil things, and he is still in control, and uh, he knows what he's doing. Um, and, and the prophet often, oftentimes struggled with, with trying to figure out, well, okay, but why are you doing it like this? And so that's kind of a big theme there, that, that God is still in control. Another big theme of the book is doubt. We see the, we see the prophet struggling with these questions, having this back-and-forth dialogue with God. Um, where he'll say something, then God will say something, then he'll say something, then God will say something. Um, and uh, so you just see really just this this prophet who's just struggling to understand God. And uh, then another big thing is that God, uh, you, that God uses immoral people to bring about his own purposes. So there's nothing in life where it's like, this is a bad situation, so God can't use it. God can use anything. Just like um, he used Satan's temptation in the book of Job to incite the people to raid Job, God was still behind that, and he still used that. So, so the same in the book of Habakkuk, um, God was still in control. Um, it was written in the mid to late 600s, so ba about 650 to about 612. Um, how we can date it is because um, he talks about the rise of the Chaldeans. Um, these are also known as the Babylonians. Um, Assyria as an empire didn't fall until 612, or, or that's when Nineveh fell. Um, there might have been a small resistance that continued till 609. I might, I might be wrong on that. Um, anyways, and so this was before Assyria's fall, so we can date it some, then from sometime between 650 and 612. Um, so Assyria was a, was a big empire um, from... The, the the Near East, um, Mesopotamia area there. Um, their capital was the city of Nineveh. Uh, Jonah went to the, went there, and um, Nahum prophesied against it. But long story short, uh, a city that had religious significance, but actually had been destroyed by Assyria before, um, and then was 
rebuilt called Babylon, um, they had these people called the Chaldeans who rose to power and just slowly started chipping away at the Syrian Empire and very surprisingly overthrew Assyria. It was very unexpected. And then within just a few short years, uh, a total of 70 years, Babylon fell. So it was just kind of this really surprising thing uh, for the ancient world at the time that Babylon could so quickly come to power and then they could so quickly lose the power. Uh, Persia, for instance, kept power for hundreds of years and then later um, in the medieval ages they rose again to power. So it's just fascinating that, <laughs> that Persia could be such a strong and lengthy empire and Babylon could be so short. Um, so the book is it, this is a basic outline of the book um, and in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 1 the prophet basically says why don't you take care of the sinners and verses 5 through 11 of the same chapter um, God answers and says I'm raising up the evil Chal uh, Chaldeans to punish um, the sinners and then in verses 12 through the beginning of chapter 2 um, the prophet kind of doesn't really like that. <laughs> so why are you using people worse than us to punish us? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. We're, we're sinners, but I mean, at least we're not that bad. <laughs> like, we're not them. <laughs> like, if, if we had, you know, a, a list here, you know, there's, uh, you know, up here, there's, there's, there's Israelites, and then there's the child molesters, and then there's the Chaldeans, you know. And we're better than them, you know. And yet God's still using them, and it's like, oh, wow. Um, and so then uh, God gives his final reply in, in verse 2 of chapter 2 all the way to verse 20 and basically says, I'm in control and I'll punish all the sinners. So it's like, oh, well, okay. And so then the book ends in chapter 3 with the prophet. Basically, it's a song, um, and it goes the entire length of the chapter. Um, so, yeah. But one thing I do want to specify is that God doesn't always work in this way. He doesn't always raise up someone more evil than you to punish you. That's how he did it here. God does a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah. So keep that in mind. I know some people try and make it make. They don't really understand how to use the prophets. They'll say that's always the case. God will always raise up the Chaldeans. This person is your Chaldean. It's like, well, I'll pause with that. <laughs> uh, it's not saying that this is always the way that God has to work. So. Um, just a, f a few things I want to kind of explore, and please feel free to give as lengthy of an answer as you want. Um, just, yeah. Why does God allow evil if he's in control? Okay, he could test us through any means. Why does he put us through pain, especially if we're serving him? What do you guys think? There's no right or wrong answer. happy and we're always have good things coming we don't we can't really appreciate what we have and um, what we're going through so in order to we have to go through pain okay and I, I I'm not quite clear do you believe that or are you just saying that that's what you heard you've heard um from what I've seen in life I I think I believe it like one of the happiest people I've ever seen was this lady that had gotten remarried like three or four times because her husband died every time and she seriously went through cancer treatments like three or four times too and she was one of the happiest people I've ever seen and I'm like how can you be so happy when all of your husbands have died and you've gone through cancer so much and she doesn't have any hair because so much cancer went through um, so much chemo and everything that her hair will not grow back and it's like and she was one of the happiest people I've ever seen it's like holy crap hmm. Do you think that that's the only way that God could have given her that? Um, no, I, 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 I think certain people need certain things. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I, I, I always felt like that happened to her because she could be a uh, you know, witness to other people. They're going through, you know, some things that she went through. Like I, I see people now that are Christians that go through cancer and they have such a bitter attitude. And I'm like. 
how could she go through so much more than them and have such a good attitude and this person have such a bitter attitude? It's 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 really it really uh, bogs my mind. So I'm not criticizing. I'm just trying to keep the conversation going. Um, why couldn't God just circumnavigate that and then nobody would have to learn from that experience because God could have just told them. Um, why did he have to stick them in pain? Oh, that's fine. You don't have to. I was just trying to... I'm not criticizing. I'm not saying I don't agree with you either. I'm just trying to keep conversation going. Nicole, did you have any ideas? Want to come back to you? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Ben, did you have anything? No? Okay, that's fine. Dan? I think the the answer to the first question, where does God allow evil to be in control? I think the the reason it's not because God is allowing evil. Evil, I mean, the devil will do whatever he wants to do. It's just it's up to us what we want to do with what decisions we make. I mean, if we're gonna make the right choices all the time, that's pretty much God dictating us what to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um. So let me ask you. Um, so are do you kind of think that then Satan kind of has free reign with what he does? Is is that what you're saying? Or? No. Um, I mean, God said that he he will um, cause all kinds of evil in the world. Mm -hmm. You know. Now it's up to us. Do we want to listen to the evil or do we want to listen to God? Which majority of the people they will do whatever they feel like, which is evil stuff. I got you. It's not that God allows it, it's just it's a people choice. Do you think that if everyone in the world right now decided to do be good, you know, do God's do do God's thing, that there would be no more cancer? No, I don't believe that. Okay. I, well the see that's not evil. Right. Well it's just God allowing us to go through trials because that's how we get closer to him. Okay. Uh, now, why do we go through pain and all that? I mean, the Bible says we're going to go through trials, we're going to go through pain, we're going to go through... Because this is not our final home. And uh, if he went through all the all the tests, I mean, not, not that God went through cancer, it's just, a, you know, it's just one small line there. But I think that if God went through, uh, I'm sure he... He knew. Um, he sees the future, and I think he knows. Um, if he wouldn't have said that in a Bible, there would be a big disappointment. Disappointment for us, not knowing that God will actually let that happen. Mm -hmm. Because if the Bible wouldn't say, then we would be like, "Well, God didn't say we're going to go through this." So why do you think God allows that? For the for the pain and all, and, and all that unpleasantness. Because we're not perfect. So why does he why 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 did why did he do it that way? I guess that's a better way of asking. Blame it on Adam and Eve. <laughs> I was kidding. gonna say, doesn't it go back to Adam and Eve? <laughs> well, I mean, God did say you're going to go through pain. So could but why we... does God allow it? I don't know. Could could we could we blame it on Eve since she, you know she did eat first you know? Not Adam no. because he allowed his wife to. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, she was, was a strong, independent again? woman. Oh, <laughs> <I can't laughs> just trying to get the revolution started. <laughs> oh my, oh my. I, I think my personal opinion is because if we go through pain, that's how we we get to grow more in Christ. And if it's a testimony for somebody to lift them spiritually, then so be it. Okay. okay. To so. me, it was a good encouragement, Debbie. Because she suffered a lot. Borowski? Yes. Okay. And I always remember that if the word that she said, if this is a testimony for people to get saved, for me to go through pain, then I'll accept that. Mm, that's okay. a good point. That's a good point. Uh, and that keeps me going. 
Did you hear what she said? Mm-hmm. If it's a testimony for someone to get saved, that's good. That's good. That's can, can you define evil um, since she's been talking? Like, is that- In the question, I more mean it as a general sense of pain, sickness, suffering, sickness, evil, wrongdoing, moral fault, everything. Right, right. But you could narrow it to just simply morally um, not correct. Corrupt. Morally corrupt. Um, did you have anything? I think, well, I, I think pain has a lot of different factors. Um, a lot has been said. It helps us to grow. It helps us to depend on God. Um, one thing I think, too, is pain serves as a warning sometimes. Can you elaborate? Yeah. Okay, so like... Uh, in, in the physical, if you uh, put your hand on a hot stove or something, well, there's pain there to tell you, hey, something's wrong. Don't leave your hand there, right? right. I, think, I think sometimes that we go through pain in that in life to tell us, hey, you know, something's not right. It, it needs to be corrected. Can, can you give um, kind of a real-world uh, example? If I think about it for a minute. Okay, that's fine. Um, um, I want to say something. Good. Uh, when I was going through trials back in 2015, mm-hmm. well, things passed. Oh, it, it was it was a hard time. Then things got really good, and I felt like I was when things were good. I felt like I was not as close to God as I was when I was in trials, when I was in pain. And I literally told Pastor, I said, I miss the trials and I miss the suffering because that's my time when I drop closer to God. Mm. I mean, not that anybody wants to go through pain, but that was my, that that's my, I don't know, my, my little lifeline, I guess. I get you. Which mm. I experienced myself. I mean, I will say there, there's been obvious times in, in, in my ministry where, you know, the times when there's the greatest need is the time, times when God's used me the most, you know, and then kind of when things leveled off again, you know, it's kind of like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you have time to think yeah. about it? And I know we've kind of gone over it before, but, you know, when we go through any type of pain, it's harder to trust God. And I think he kind of uses the pain to pull us closer to it. But at the same time, like Chuck said, you know, with pain being kind of like that one, like, hey, maybe something in your life isn't right. Mm-hmm. Maybe you need to go back and you need to fix that. But at the same time, I'm trying to think. Sure, take your time. Ben, did you have anything you wanted to add? Just watching the freak show, right? <laughs> I think I think God uses pain also to um, to um, see whether we're want to draw closer to Him or further away from Him. You know, to see uh, how serious we are with Him. You know, I used to not really care about stuff like this. I thought, well, what does it matter? God's God, and he'll do whatever the heck he wants, and you just leave it leave it at that. But I've kind of I – have, I have a vested interest in this question now at this point because, you know, you have a lot of people who are suffering, and they don't want to surrender their lives to God. But then even though they deny God, they still want to hold God accountable for the pain. And it's like – I. I for the first time in my life, I understand where they're coming from. You know what I mean? I understand the question itself. And coming from a Christian background, it was hard for me to understand what they were asking. You know what I mean? Because I grew up and it's like, well, God's God and that's just that. But, you know, rubbing shoulders with people who, you know, didn't grow up with that, it helps you to see things in kind of a different, different way than you always grew up with. And um, 
then I guess the, the, the icing on the cake was, um, you know, when I went to the hospital and all these other people died at the same time and I came out with no permanent physical damage, it was fine. You know, and then I'm fine and then Chuck's kidneys shut down. I mean, this is literally what I prayed to God when, when Chuck's kidneys fell. They said, didn't you already give him enough? I mean, his legs don't work. He's stuck in a wheelchair. He's had to, he's had to deal with the faith people who tried to throw him out of his wheelchair. Can't that just be enough? Like, why are you picking on Chuck? Meanwhile, I'm in perfect health. I don't understand this, God. It's it's almost like being irritated at God that your life is going too good. Does that make sense? <laughs> and you know, and then I keep seeing other people, you know, have all these problems and whatnot, and it's like it's hard as a pastor to deal with other people going through loss you know like Jamie getting cancer well why Jamie you know what <laughs> you know and then you, it start, you, you start trying trying to think about it and then we looked at the in, in Job where he's talking about you know it's because you sinned that this happened you know or because once again the parents sinned or whatever um, and it just it just I, I've, I've gained I've gained an appreciation for this question. Did you have time to... Yeah, I couldn't do that well. That's fine. That. We'll just keep going, and if you think about it, just flag me down and we'll stop, okay? Um, were and you going to say something? I got my example. Okay, go ahead. Um, so my, my great uncle that died, well, he had... I mean, he, he didn't really, for a long time, he didn't really have, like, health problems and stuff, you know. And so one year at I think it was Thanksgiving, like he tells his wife, I'm leaving you. Like, Thanksgiving dinner was done and he's like, I'm leaving you. Okay. Was it that bad? So <laughs> So he left and he just kinda went and did his own thing. Like, um when he was younger than that he was involved in church. Uh -huh. He was close to God in that but he just went off and did his own thing for several years. Okay. And then he came down with COPD. <coughs> and as he got sicker and was experiencing more pain in that, he he realized where he had messed up in life. And he he reconciled. They didn't like get remarried or that, but he reconciled with his ex wife. And he reconciled with family members and, and stuff like that and had to do with them in, in his last days and that. Yeah. And he was very he was very remorseful, you know, that that he had wasted all that time and that. But the pain and the the just being out there like he was, it it kind of showed him that, you know. If he would have just been in perfect health, I think, until he died or whatever, yeah. you know. I don't know if he ever would have reconciled. Hmm. Wow. I remember in California there was somebody who, something similar, it wasn't, it wasn't um, exactly like that. And long story short, um, his son... Like he was trying to make amends and stuff because he he was it was I think it was terminal cancer, yeah. and uh, I mean there was nothing they could do they couldn't even do anything to slow it down like it was just like you you best set things in affairs like you're gonna die within the next couple weeks, and and uh, anyways uh, so he tried to start you know bearing the hatchet or whatever you say, and uh, uh, his son did not even so he died without his son ever. Yeah. I. Uh, yeah. Yep. Anyways. So, kind of just following this, uh, following up on that, and I don't want to spend too much time here, so I'll just kind of read the questions, and if I want you to answer them, I'll, I'll draw special attention to it. But just think about the uh, about the questions, okay? First question. Why did God allow pain and suffering in the first place? Th think about that. I mean, here's God. He could have created any system in any way. 
But God created it in such a way where there would be pain and suffering. And obviously there's a whole thing about, well, Adam and Eve. I, yeah, I'm not denying that. But the after effects of Adam and Eve were still pain and suffering. And so, so, so there's that. Next question I want you guys to think about. Do we all deserve punishment simply because we were unfortunate enough to be born by Adam? Think about this. Genuinely think about this. Do we deserve punishment simply because Adam was our forefather? Just think about it. You, I, I'm not looking for answers here. Just... See, because some people say, you know, that's how can a just God punish me for the sins of my forefather, basically? Which, I understand the question. Next question I want you guys to think about. Do we really deserve punishment? So it's kind of more narrow than, than the other one. Do, do, look at yourself and do you say, and do you, do you believe that you are someone who deserves to be punished, or do you think you're someone who's basically good? Think about that. These are, uh, sometimes I feel like, as Christians, we don't really, sometimes we just kind of ignore these hard questions, and, and, and people out there in the world, they're actually asking these questions. Many people out there think, I don't deserve for God to kill me. I don't deserve for God to punish me. You know, what kind of a mean, heartless God is this who's just like chasing me down to pick on me? And uh, so just some, some thoughts that I had. Um, the sins of the fathers affect children. The sins of the fathers affect children. See, Adam and Eve sinned, and it affect all, affected all of us. But the righteousness of Abraham, for instance, affected all of us too. The righteousness of Jesus affected, affected all of us. So, so the sins of the fathers definitely do affect the children. But something that's something that's important to notice, and, and the Bible draws a clear distinction here, children are not punished for the sins of the father, even though they sometimes will have to endure the consequences. See what I mean? For instance, you, your father, let's say, is a, um, you know, the, he beats his wife. Well, so then as you grow up, some people will always have that, oh, he's the son of that, Wife beater. See what I mean? Even though you didn't necessarily do anything wrong, you just have to carry that baggage. Especially in small towns, you know. Oh boy, in small towns. Um, <coughs> so then the question is okay, but if we're not really, if we're not, if children aren't punished for the sins of their parents, aren't we being punished by li having to live in a broken world? I mean, isn't that kind of punishment? It. it Shouldn't, shouldn't everything start on ground zero for each, for each generation? Um, and here's the, here's the thing, I, the argument that, that, that God raised in the book of Job that I want to repeat that we looked at a couple weeks ago. If we don't understand how nature works, how can we possibly fully understand how God's justice works? That's, that's one, of God, one of the big things that God, that God said in Job. He spent a lengthy time saying it, too. I think that there may be something there. <laughs> if God spent so long saying that, I think that maybe we should we should consider that. If we don't understand everything about how nature works, uh, for instance, DNA. You know, there's a large part of DNA, uh, uh, of our DNA that we don't even understand what it's there for, what it does. A large part of it, we we understand a very small part of of, of, of DNA. I mean, think about that. So just some final, some final thoughts that, that I was thinking about with with these questions that, that I've been raising. First off, God is always working. Whether we get to be a part of it is up to us. God is always working, always working. If we make ourselves enemies of God by not doing his will in life, God will still use it. It's just that we won't be included in it because God is always working in everything, and he has a way of turning everything to, to, to his will. I mean – he, there's never a moment in history where he's just like, oh, man, I really missed out on that one. Like, he's always in control of these things. Then um, uh, just a few a few smaller points. God uses these things to grow, to grow our character. Uh, somebody brought this up. Actually, I think a couple people brought this one up. Um, if there was never an opportunity for our character to grow, how would we 
grow. I mean, in pain and, and evil and all these things, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it, it sucks, but it's not the end of the story like Diana brought up. It's, this isn't the end of the story. And God is using this, this momentary uh, pain for the sake of growing our character. Sometimes that seems a little bit maybe circuitous. Why why bother building our character? Why not just go ahead and take us into heaven and be done with it? You know, once again, God has his own ways. Um, our rebellion of God uh, introduced a curse into the world. It's our it's our own fault. It, you know, we can say, well, that was Adam and Eve. Who of us can say that we're sinless? So haven't we <laughs> been, of course? Uh, so haven't we kind of repeated the sins of the Father? So then doesn't that kind of include us in the punishment then? God said it like this in the law. I will by no means hold somebody, hold the guilty sin, uh, the guilty sinless, but I will punish them up to the third or fourth generation of those who, um, how does he say it? Basically of those who continue the sin of the Father. I forget how he says it. He doesn't say it like that. It really irritates me that I can't think of how that said. It's in the book of Exodus. Um, it's in chapter uh, 20 or 21. <clears throat> it really bothers me that I can't remember that. I hate that. He's talking about – it's right after the idol. So that would have had to be closer to chapter 30. Because um, Moses is is praying on their behalf, trying to get him to um, to not kill them. Um, let's see, it's in chapter It's right in this area. I just can't find the, the part that I'm looking for. Don't favor my sight. Oh my goodness, pass before you. <sighs> okay, right here. Chapter 34, verse 7. Um, who keeps his and keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Um, it says, of those who hate me. It's not in this Bible. It's very bothering. Exodus 33, what? 34, um, 7 was the part that I mentioned. Or maybe it repeats it in a different place. Check, can you look that up? And it's in Exodus. It says, um, I'll by no means um, leave the guilty unpunished. The Exodus 34 one that you mentioned? Yeah, but I think that it might be repeated somewhere else where he says, of those who hate me. And then he says, but um, I will show mercy to the thousandth generation of those who love me. Um, and so it's not 34-7, it's somewhere else. Verse 6. Come in, come in. Or uh, there's also mention of it in Deuteronomy. 20 verse 6. You, you can have a seat, Zach. Yeah, there it is. But showing loving, loving kindness to thousands. To th okay, before the verse before that, probably. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of 
those who hate me. The part the part that I was that I was looking at in chapter thirty four that's a condensed version. Yeah. Um, basically, it's it's when there's a condensed version of something like that, it's making reference of it without quoting the whole thing. So don't don't worry about that part. This is the part that I was looking at. Um, yeah. So for it says for those who hate me. So in other words, if a child repeats follows in the same sin as the father, see what I mean? But of those who love me, I will bless them to the thousandth generation. So it's a, a, a big difference there, okay? Okay. I took a long time to, to say that one point there. <laughs> Maybe next time I should write down the verse. Um, God is showing mercy to people who don't want to listen. You have to understand, these people who we despise, these people, who are just pains in the butt? These 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 people who are just God loves them, and God allows things to continue to be broken to show mercy. He knows who will believe and who will not believe, but He still gives opportunity, even if He knows that somebody won't turn. He still gives them opportunity. God is giving opportunity for us to choose to obey in the midst of unfair situations. That's absolutely true. God definitely is giving us opportunity. Um, remember what I said a couple of years ago. No real decision can be made in a vacuum. If there was never an opportunity to disobey God, then you couldn't really ever be said that you actually obeyed God. It's, it's just the way of things. So, in part, God kind of has to make these unfair situations to give us the actual opportunity to turn to him. So, we're going to stop there. Um, we'll pick up next week with Habakkuk uh, chapter 1. Um, so, any questions before we...